Hey everyone, it's me, Jakov, and I'm back with a new installment in my series, Units of Total War, Rise of Mordor. Today is going to be a bit different, because I'm going to be covering an elven faction for the first time in the series, so that'll be a nice change of pace, that elven faction being in Mladris. If you're new to the channel, in this series, I look at a faction in the mod Rise of Mordor for the game Total War Attila, the mod being linked in the description of course, going over the history of the faction within the books and films of Tolkien's universe, before looking at the real life civilizations that inspired them. After that, I look at the units of the faction, discussing their battlefield role as well as looking at their equipment and seeing how historically authentic the units are. Before I begin discussing the faction, I do want to give a bit of a disclaimer. In the current state of the mod, the faction has an extremely small roster, with units that all share similar appearances. Rest assured that when the faction gets updated, I'll make a new video on it like I will with all the factions that get updated, but for now, view this video as a snapshot of what Imladris looked like at this point in time. With that out of the way, let's begin the breakdown of Imladris as a faction. Imladris, better known as Rivendell to viewers, is an elven settlement in western Middle-earth, located in the western regions of the Misty Mountains, a mountain range that splits western Middle-earth in half. While not a great kingdom or region like other factions that we've looked at, Imladris is nevertheless an important faction in Middle-earth that has played its part in shaping the history of the continent. While Imladris refers to a specific elven settlement, Imladris as a faction contains under its banner the surrounding areas, meaning the faction's strength is not solely drawn from its capital. The history of Imladris stretches back to the middle of the Second Age of Middle-earth, and during the war between the Elves and Sauron, the great elven kingdom of Oregion was sacked by the forces of the Dark Lord. During the chaos, the Elves of the neighbouring kingdom of Linden sent troops to aid the people of Oregion. However, finding the situation untenable, the troops retreated, picking up refugees before fortifying a valley to defend themselves under the order of their leader, an elf named Elrond. It was this temporary fortification that would go on to become Imladris, withstanding Sauron's armies with the assistance of the humans of Numenor. After surviving its first trial, Imladris would go on to be one of the chief elven centers of power under its leader Elrond, who would be given one of three great rings, which further strengthened Imladris. In the final years of the Second Age, Imladris would see war again, with its forces fighting in the War of the Last Alliance alongside the kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor, descendants of Numenor which had helped Imladris in its time of need. By the war's end, Sauron and his armies lay defeated, yet the cost was high. Many elves had fallen in the war, including the High King of the Elves, Gilgalad, who was succeeded by Elrond, who became the de facto leader of the elves west of the Misty Mountains fighting in the war. During the coming Third Age, Imladris would remain a refuge and sanctuary for the free peoples of Middle-earth, as well as a potent military power, fighting against the Dark Kingdom of Angmar and its leader, the Witch King, for many years. With the complete collapse of the Northern Kingdom of Arnor, Imladris would play a key role as the place in which the heirs of both Gondor and Arnor would be raised, preventing the forces of Sauron from ending the line of kings for centuries, while also housing the artifacts of Arnor such as the blade Narsil, which had cut the ring of power off Sauron's hands, the heir during the War of the Ring being the ranger of the North Aragorn. By the time of the Hobbit, Imladris, while still being a magical centre, as well as the informal headquarters for the free peoples of Middle-earth who opposed Sauron's will, such as the White Council, it had lost much of its power and population, something which would become abundantly clear during the time of the War of the Ring, when Elrond, ruler of Imladris at this point for over 4,000 years, made it clear that the settlement lacked the strength to face Sauron in open war. Speaking to Imladris' role as the headquarters of the enemies of Sauron, it was here during the Fellowship of the Ring that the Great Council was held, attempting to discover how to deal with the One Ring and their collective wisdom, before deciding to destroy it in the fires of Mount Doom. Throughout the War of the Ring, Imladris would avoid any direct conflict, not being attacked by the Dark Forces, but instead dispatching Elrond's sons, Eladan and Elrohir, to join the Great Company of Rangers in helping Aragorn with the fighting to the south. At the end of the war, while victorious, Imladris would slowly become empty as its elven population made the decision to leave Middle-earth for the Undying Lands, leaving behind a beautiful, if sad, homely house. Now that we've looked at the history of Imladris from an in-universe perspective, Let's look at where it draws inspiration from historically, in both its appearance in the books and the films. Visually wise, Imladris is, if the story is to be believed, 
based off of a Swiss valley that Tolkien once saw and was captivated with, his descriptions and drawings of Imladris being quite close to the real location, which was then used as inspiration for the film incarnation of Imladris, which was quite prominent in the Lord of the Rings series as well as in the Hobbit trilogy. Aesthetic-wise, Imladris, like all elven civilization, shares a kinship with nature, with the buildings of elves taking inspiration from the natural forms and shapes of the world, a process which is also quite clear in the arms and armour that the elves bear. Society-wise, I can't think of a historical civilization which shares many similarities with Imladris, although if you do, please post it in the comments. I'm really interested in hearing other people's opinions on it. At best, the closest comparison I could find would be maybe something like Alexandria, the city in Egypt, which was known for housing many ancient scrolls and tomes, something similar to Imladris, which was also known as being a repository of ancient texts. But apart from that, that's the best I can do in regards to historical comparisons. Having said all that, I'd say that we've broken Imladris down enough to begin looking at the handful of units the faction has in its roster, starting with one of its potential general units, and here is the first of Imladris's potential general units, the Guards of Imladris. And I say the first of Imladris's potential units, because unlike many of the other factions that we've looked at, almost every unit in Imladris's roster can be its general unit, except for maybe one, one of its cavalry units, who we'll be getting to later on in the review. So starting off with the Guards of Imladris, We'll take a look at their armour. They all wear the standard elven helmet that you see in the Fellowship of the Ring and not so much in the later films in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I believe you see this most prominently in the Fellowship of the Ring, more so during the prologue battle. However, the elves that you see fight in the prologue battle are not elves of them larger so much as they are elves of Linden, although you do see Elrond in the fighting. Design-wise, their helmets look very much like ancient Greek Corinthian helmets with the large crest on top, however instead of having a horsehair crest or a feather crest, these troops have a metal crest on top. Ornamentation was something that was definitely done in history. I don't know whether or not a helmet with this specific design existed, but crests and the like were definitely used on helmets. As you can see, apart from its standard shape, the helmets are all very highly decorated, which stand testament to the elves skills as master craftsmen so it makes sense that their armour would all be top notch. More so looking at the faction roster right now because all of the units that they can field are all of their most elite troops. Later on when more lower tier troops get added you'll see that not everything in Mladus can field as top of the line. But we'll get to that in a later day and in a later video whenever that time comes. Now these troops have no shield which makes sense, they're pikemen. However, historically, there were pike units who did use shields, such as, for example, Alexander the Great's Macedonian phalanxes. His phalangites did have small shields. However, it's equally accurate to portray these pikemen as not having shields because that was done just as much. In regards to their pikes, they're kind of inaccurate in regards to the blade shape, and that's something that you see come up quite a bit in this mod, and more so in the material from which the mod draws inspiration, the Lord of the Rings film trilogy. The thing is with pikes, pikes are long weapons, obviously. So as a way of counterbalancing the long weight that will inevitably come from having such a long wooden shaft, the tip of the pike is almost always a small metal point. You don't want to put too much metal on the end of the pike, otherwise the pike becomes unwieldy. Here, the elves have mounted massive sword blades to the end of each of their pikes. That's very historically inaccurate and would make these pikes massively heavy. If the blade was cut down far shorter, it would be far more historically accurate. Instead, these look like absolutely gigantic naginatas, the spear weapons utilised by Japanese warriors. So that's definitely not a point for historical accuracy for the unit. It does look cool and it does fit in with the aesthetic of the elves of using large blades. However, as a pike, it's not really that accurate. Coming down and looking at their armour, you can see that they're all heavily equipped and they all share the standard elven armour design. In regards to the elves' armour, there's really no historical analogue that matches their armour. The best I can kind of think of is... Roman armour, specifically Lorica Segmentata, that comes kind of the closest to this form of armour. It's definitely plate armour, however it's very much segmented plate. As I just said, that Roman armour would be the closest to this. And even then it's not a very apt comparison. 
In regards to what else they bear on their bodies, they do have van braces, which are very much historically accurate. The bands of steel surrounding their body, that I've already discussed. I can't really go much into the details of these guys' armour, because it's not really that historical to begin with, so I can't offer much in the way of a historical breakdown in situations like this. I will say that the armour does look magnificent, and in terms of its functionality, I reckon this would be fairly functional, especially if you take into mind that the elves are considered master craftsmen, so it does kind of make sense that they'd be wearing armour that's a bit more advanced and works in different ways compared to the armour worn by other species in Middle-earth. However, historical-wise, this armour's a bit weird. I personally love it, though. I really think it helps set elves apart from everyone else. As you can see, they've got their shoulder armour covered in plates all going down. Historically accurate, having layered lobstered armour like that. That was done in the past. Are their necks armoured? No. That seems kind of a bit of a weakness. You'd want to protect the neck. The face being relatively unprotected. Now, that is historically accurate. Many helmets had open faces. But the neck is very much a weak point, especially when you're this heavily armoured. In regards to their legs, it looks like they've got a male coat underneath all of this plate armour that they've got on. So... That will give protection for their upper legs, and they've got leather gloves as well. Having looked at the unit's armour, let's try and find their officer and see if he stands out from his men. Much like his men, this officer wears the same type of armour as his troops. However, he is lacking a pike like his men, and he's also lacking a helmet like his men, which is not historically accurate. You'd want to wear a helmet. However, with that beautiful blonde hair, I think we can kind of give him a bit of leeway in this situation. In terms of his arms and armour, he has a one-handed blade, which is quite common for elven warriors to use. From a historical basis, the blade that the elven warrior uses reminds me of a Yadagan, which is a blade wielded by Ottoman troops during the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. And the Yadagan itself is based on Central Asian blades, which are where the origin of sabres come from, so I very much get that vibe from it. It also kind of reminds me a bit of some Indian swords that you'd see being wielded during the Middle Ages and into the early modern age. So definitely a cool looking weapon. For this officer, it serves more of an arming sword kind of role. In terms of defense, he has a large kite shield, kind of. And I say kind of because it's not truly shaped like a kite shield. It does have the cutouts on the side for spear blades. And that is kind of historical. What the shield most reminds me of though, is the shields used by Celtic warriors. However, being shaped into a leaf shape or a teardrop shape, which also stands in line with the nature association that elves have, with the large central boss in the centre, which is quite historical for shields to have, I may add. However, looking at the shield overall, it is heavily ornately decorated, and it might be steel, and entirely metal shields aren't really a historical thing, especially at that size. For small size shields such as bucklers, yes, but for massive shields like that, no. More so, having your shield that ornately decorated is, in my personal opinion, a bit of a waste of money, especially if you're putting in gold, silver, gems onto it. You're kind of wasting an item that's designed to be destroyed in battle. Having equipment like swords be highly decorated, well, I'm not a big fan of it. I think there's a certain reason to do it, because you're not really expecting to have your blade destroyed. But a shield is kind of there to absorb punishment and be destroyed. So having it be that ornately decorated isn't something I find to be very logical. Not saying it's not historical, because there are very much highly decorated historical shields, but logically you don't want to put out your best goods to be destroyed on the front lines. The guards of Imladris, as you can probably tell, are a pikeman unit, so they're very good at killing cavalry, blocking off choke points, and generally being a very useful unit. However, much like all pike units, they have the same two weaknesses. They're vulnerable to attacks from the rear, or the flank, and they're very vulnerable to arrow fire. Now, these guys are very heavily armoured. However, against the archers, because they're all lacking shields except for the officer, they will be torn apart by archer fire. So that is something that's a weakness for them. More so, the fact that the guards of Imladris can be a general unit means that if they get targeted down by enemy archer fire, you have a very high chance of losing your general, because your general will be lacking the equipment to defend himself sufficiently from enemy archer fire. So that's always something to think about if you make your guards of Imladris your general unit. Another thing to consider when fielding the guards of Imladris is that there's a limit on how many of these pikemen you can bring. So unlike other factions which can bring many pikemen units to the battlefield, Imladris is very limited in the number of pikes it can bring. 
only being able to have three. Now, three Guards of Enlarged is a massive amount of firepower for your army to have, but just keep in mind that other factions can do Pike armies better than Enlarged can. And we'll move on from the one and only Pike unit that the faction can field to the one and only Swordsman unit that the faction can field, the Noldoran Swordsman. Now, looking at the Noldoran Swordsman, one thing you see immediately is that these guys are shock infantry. And yes, they are. Because it turns out that Amladris does not have any sword and shield infantry whatsoever. All they've got are Noldoran Swordsmen, who are armed with massive two-handed blades. Now, looking at their armor, I can't really say much because they wear much the same armor as the guards of Amladris. The only difference being that these guys' armor is a bit more extensive than the armor worn by the guards of Amladris, which makes sense because the guards of Amladris are designed to keep enemies at bay with their pikes. The Noldoran swordsmen are designed to get deep in combat with the enemy, so it makes sense that they'd be somewhat more heavily armored. So, for example, looking at their arms, their arms are fully covered in metal armor, as opposed to the guards of Enlarger, whose arms are partially covered in armor. Let's try and find their commanding officer. And here he is, and their commanding officer is equipped much the same as the other officer. He has the same type of sword, the same type of shield, the same type of beautiful silver armor. And again, just looking at it, you can see what I mean when I say I get Roman vibes for the armor. They do have folds protecting their upper legs, which is pretty cool. However, I don't see any greaves on their lower legs, which is a bit of a disappointment. None of the troops have shields except for the officer, because they're two-handed shock infantry. Looking at the blades, they're very much large, falchion-shaped blades on curved handles. And this design, while not necessarily historic, is actually very, very, very effective. Because with the large handles like that, you can grip them with two hands. You can also put a lot of leverage into your strikes, meaning that these guys can deal out a ton of damage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the blades also fit the aesthetic of the elves pretty well too being rounded and curved in a way that's similar to the designs that you often see in nature, with like curving vines and branches and the like. In terms of these guys all on the battlefield, they kind of have a bit of an odd role, because they're both shock troops and they're your line infantry, which means if you're using them as line infantry, you're going to want to counter charge, even if you're on the defensive, because you don't want to let these guys absorb enemy fire, because that is a big weakness that they have. Because these guys lack shields, they're much more vulnerable to arrow fire than other elven sword units. So that's always something to worry about when deploying these guys. Apart from that, as shock troops, they're also very vulnerable to cavalry, more so than other infantry equipped with shields too. So again, this unit does have its weaknesses, however, a whole army of these guys can be very nasty in close combat. And given that you're an elven faction that uses long-range archers of ultra-high quality, the enemy won't want to get into a ranged battle with you for any amount of time, because their units will almost always lose. It's in their best interest to bring their units into a melee battle, where these troops' superior combat abilities will prevail. However, you do have to be careful with the Noldoran swordsmen nonetheless. Moving on from them, we have the Noldoran archers, and these guys look much the same as their Noldor and Swordsman kin. The only difference being that instead of using swords as their main weapon, these guys do have blades except their secondary weapons. They have the same type of elven saber that the other officers have. In terms of their main weapon, they use a elven longbow, and being elves, these guys are ultra effective with the longbow. These guys are the only archer force that the faction can field right now, and they are very deadly archers, so they definitely fulfill that role well. These guys are far superior to most other archer units that they'll face in battle, and the only units that really come close or even outpace these guys in battle would probably be other elven archer units. Maybe the men of Dale's archers, but that's about it. I can't think of anything else that would approach these guys' level. Here is their commanding officer, another beautiful elven warrior. And he has much the same armor and equipment as the other officers, so I'm not going to get into details with him. Looking at these guys' role on the battlefield, as I said before, they are archers, and they do that role very well. However, they are fairly well armored, which means that once they run out of arrows, they can be used in melee combat to good effect. You do want to be careful with them, you don't want to waste them in melee combat, but using them as flanking forces, or even as frontal forces in some cases, these guys can do the job fairly well. Moving on from their archers, We'll now look at the Noldor and Horsemen. And as you can see, these guys are heavy cavalry. However, they're not shock cavalry, they're heavy spear cavalry. And they are very cool looking spear cavalry too. They're equipped much the same as the rest of the Noldor and Horses that the faction can field. The only difference being they're on horseback. 
and they wield massive glaive-like spears on horseback. Now, were large spears used historically? Yes. Were they used as lances such as these? Not necessarily. However, this type of blade makes for an excellent shoeing weapon. So, with cavalry like this, you can both stab and slash your enemy to death with these massive spears. And the shields only add to their defensive status. In regards to their horses, the horses are unarmored, meaning the horses can't withstand enemy attacks that easily. They're not a shock cavalry unit, which means that when they enter battle against the enemy, they're meant to get stuck into the melee. They're not meant to run out and do cycle charges. They can, and they'll do fairly well at it, but they are designed to absorb damage, so they are pretty good in melee. Because this is one of the few units that the faction can field, horsemen have become far more useful as part of your army than other factions. So if you're building an army for them largest, you're going to have to try and balance cavalry and infantry. In regards to the films made by Peter Jackson, you actually do see these Noldoran horsemen. I believe you see them in the first Hobbit film, where they save the company of dwarves from being killed by orc marauders. Moving on from the Noldoran horsemen, we come to another cavalry unit that the faction can field, and it's a pretty unique cavalry unit too, the Noldoran rangers. Now these guys are heavy ranged cavalry units, and... That's actually pretty unique compared to most of the other factions we've looked at. I may be wrong in saying this, but I don't think any of the other factions had any heavy cavalry that served as bowmen. In regards to these guys' armour, it's the same as the rest. In regards to their armour, they've got longbows. In regards to their horses, their horses are unarmoured. In terms of their officer, he is equipped much the same as other officers, brandishing a blade and a shield. Also, none of these guys have shields, which makes sense because they're a bow cavalry unit. In terms of these guys' role on the battlefield, they're very useful at wearing down enemy forces by picking them off in battle. Now, the Noldoran Rangers are one of the potential general units for the faction to field, and as a general unit, they're actually very good. Because they're so heavily armoured, even though they are bow cavalry, they can serve as shock cavalry, or at least as melee cavalry when needed, which means you can use these guys to evade enemy archer fire and enemy infantry, go around the back and shoot into their rear, and then charge them. So these guys can serve multiple purposes on the battlefield, making them very useful and very critical to being successful if you want to play as them largest. Now that we know the Noldoran Rangers' capabilities as both a regular unit and as a general unit, let's move on to the last unit that the faction can field. It's Onagers. Looking at their crew, the Onagers have crewmen who are all heavily armoured in the same armour that the rest of the faction have. Looking at the equipment that they have, they've just got standard Onagers. And much of my same points for Onagers in other videos stands here. Onagers are useful because they give factions the ability to go into siege battles using artillery as a way to make gains rather than relying on superior manpower to drown out enemy forces, which is something that Imladris most definitely cannot do because Imladris can't field a large army. Even when its roster is full, Imladris is definitely going to be an army that relies on quality rather than quantity. Having Onagers helps that strategy that little bit more. However, Onagers themselves are very much widespread throughout all the factions in the game, which means that the elves of Imladris possessing them doesn't really give the elves an advantage. It just kind of evens the playing board, so I can't really think of much apart from the fact that it gives them siege capabilities to talk positively about. They don't have access to any other siege weapons, and even though their roster is unfinished, I don't think they'll get any other siege weapons in the future either, given that in the books and the films, Imladris never really endears itself to siege engineering the way other factions do. Looking at the faction overall, while it is definitely small right now, obviously because of its limited unit roster, it doesn't mean it's not strong. With the units it currently has, Imladris can build a very elite shock force, utilising its pike and its shock infantry to break enemy formations along with its archers before using its cavalry to finish off the survivors. And because of the limited numbers of units that the faction can field, it means the faction doesn't get access to a wide variety of strategies to use against its enemies. However, what it means is that the units can do fairly well against the enemy when utilised the right way. However, they can only be used in a certain way. So again, if you play as them largest, definitely use them as a shock force, hitting the enemy hard and fast. Overall, I really like the faction, and I can't wait for more units to be added to it. I love that these elves have silver as their main colour motif, as compared to the other elven factions, which helps differentiate them. In the future, when more units get added to the roster, I'll definitely go over the units in more detail. But for now, I just wanted to make a shorter video detailing the current state of Imladris. 
If you liked the video, please make sure to like and subscribe. I will be making more of these in the future, and the next faction coming up is one that has a very much filled out roster, so you won't need to worry about it being as short of a video. This is Jakov, signing out.